Hi, I'm David Allen Greer. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking about the technique of the inverted classroom, the way in which we approach the students when we meet them, and how we structure the class itself. In many ways, the goal of this technique is to vanish, for you to pull back to the woodwork and allow the students to learn and demonstrate their learning themselves. However, having said that, it's not that easy a process. You can't simply walk into the classroom and say, go, learn, or ask if they have any questions, or even give an impromptu lecture, though I do need to add, impromptu lectures can be useful, especially when you're trying to focus attention. In many ways, the inverted classroom is like theater, something the head of our acting department helped me to understand. You are the director, and you're helping your students to tell a story. The story is that of mastery, of learning new material and demonstrating that learning. In this process, your job is to help the students understand that story, help them understand what they bring to that, and also help them show what they are learning. In the inverted classroom, you're telling a story, and it's a story with a classic arc. Character A meets character B, they come to a moment of crisis, and the crisis is resolved. In this story, your students are one of the characters. The material is the other character, and that moment of crisis is when the students are unable to solve a problem, unable to get the result they desire, unable to make a program work. Your job is to get them through that moment of crisis, because it's at that moment when much of the true learning occurs. I begin each class with four or five minutes of informal discussion. We talk about what the students are studying, their majors, the big events that are happening on campus. This period is important because it allows me to get the students to trust me, to trust me enough to fail publicly in front of me. Public failure is an important part in the inverted classroom because in that inverted classroom, you're asking students to attempt problems and often to fail in front of their peers and in front of you. Now, when you try to have these first few moments of informal conversation, you'll be met by stone-cold silence. The students will sit there, glum, and they'll be thinking, this is an aged professor trying to be relevant to us. So you call it that. Hi, we're going to have a few moments of the aged professor trying to be relevant. What's going on? And they'll laugh or they'll giggle or they'll give you a sly look. And very quickly, they will start to open up. This process is an illustration of one of the key techniques in the inverted classroom. When you encounter a problem to learning, you have to identify it, you have to name it, and then you have to get rid of it. The story that I like to tell to illustrate it is the difference in the way you would act if a puppy came into your classroom or if a cat came into your classroom. Puppies are a disruptive force, but it's a short disruption. They come in, they're excited, they're very sociable, people will pet them, and you can very quickly return attention to the class, to the material. A cat on the other end, it's not as sociable, it'll stick to the wall, it will look carefully around the classroom to see what it wants to do, and step by step, it will suck all the attention to it. People will start to wonder, will the cat come close to me? Maybe I'm allergic to cats. Has the cat been declawed? That could be bad. So if you have a cat, even though it's not interacting with the students, you have to identify it. You have to say, well, here we have a cat that has come into the classroom. Pick it up, pet it, and send it on its way. That's the same kind of technique you need time and time again when you encounter a problem of learning. You have to see it, give its name, and say, we need to move on. Once the class has relaxed, once the students have settled into their roles, you're ready to begin. You need a plan for the inverted classroom just as you need a plan for the ordinary classroom. Generally, that plan consists of a set of problems that the students must solve or a set of tasks that they have to demonstrate in order to show that they have mastered the materials. 
You will often start the day by asking one student or another to summarize the major lessons and then take one of the simpler problems and see what they can do with it. In general, during the day, you start with simpler problems and march towards harder and more complex problems. As the semester progresses, you should not be surprised to discover that the students will often jump in with their own ideas, want to skip some of the early problems and jump to the harder problems. Your task as instructor is to determine if that's a good idea. Some of the most common problems in the inverted classroom comes when it is hijacked by a group of bright, well-intentioned students who grasp things quickly, who thrive in this open environment, and quickly run past those who are at a more elementary level. Sometimes you need to march the whole group through the fundamentals to make sure that they understand it. As you do it, you start them on with a problem. As they go through the problem, you listen to them and try to reach that point, either in one problem or in the course of the day's problem, where people start to have difficulty with the material, where they don't quite see where the next step is. That moment is the point where you can get them to start discussing the material, start discussing what they understand, and try to lead them to a fuller, richer understanding of what they have done on their own and which they must now demonstrate in public. When a student is unable to solve a problem or is going in the wrong direction, you need to stop them and do so with a minimal amount of personal embarrassment, embarrassment at personal failure. Yet you need to be firm enough that they know that they have failed and this is the wrong way to attack the issue. I have a large number of euphemisms for failure. Isn't that nice? Well, that's a lovely approach. And other bits of irony that students start to understand means that this is not the right way of approaching it. But for the most part, what I try to do when a student has become stumped or is going in the wrong direction is make it a team effort. Say that there might be someone else in the class who has a skill who can handle it. Or encourage one of their friends to step in, even if they have not volunteered. There are a couple lessons to teach here. The first is that we have different skills. The second is that we have to work as a team. And this is a process that allows you to build the feeling that the class is a team working against the material, with you standing on the side helping them. As you work, you discover that there are different skills in the students, and that one of your jobs as director is to make the best use of those different skills. In general, I've identified six kinds of students. The first are the starters. They are confident in themselves, and they are more than willing to start work on a problem or start explaining an idea to the rest of the class. The second are people I call identifiers. The people who look at a problem or look at a task and recognize what they have to do to solve it. They can't always solve it, but they know what must be demonstrated to show a problem to be true or what algorithm they need to apply. The third group I call contextualizers, although one class particularly called them the rememberers. These are the group that remember the prior lessons. In the adverted classroom, you discover that students don't think they need to remember what they've learned before, but a small group will, especially with encouragement. There is a fourth group that are called the workers, the ones that can come up and take the material that others have identified or that others have remembered from prior lessons and work on the problem. You need to encourage those who know more than they want to admit and restrain those who are beyond their ability. Fifth, there are the closers. They're the ones who look at the whole problem, look at what has been done, look at the context, and know how to get it to the final step. Commonly in the inverted classroom, you'll have people stuck agonizingly close to the end of a problem. Closers are the people who are able to complete that final step. Finally, there are a group that I call the summarizers, the ones who can describe what has been done on a problem and go through each of the steps. Often these are shyer people who don't like to get up in front of class, but they observe, and they observe very closely. As an instructor in an inverted classroom, you will do well to identify people with those different qualities and to use them appropriately to get problems solved and to get projects completed. In working with these different types of students, 
you quickly discover that your goal is to pull them into a team, and hence your role is closer to that of coach than to that of classroom instructor. I have a number of different tools and techniques I use to try to communicate that idea, to communicate the idea that I'm not the center, the material is the center, and we are a team working together to try to master that material. One of the things I use is to never call students by their first name. I always use Mr. or Ms., Mr. Chu, Ms. Greenwood. The students find that odd and awkward at first, but very quickly it settles into having a certain kind of relationship. First off, it bonds them together because they're all being called the same way. And second, it puts me at a slight distance. It indicates that I'm not going to be their friend. I'm not going to be their instructor. I'm standing on the side trying to get them to focus on our common problem, the problem of mastering the material. And in that role, I find it much easier to manage the discussion and manage the work that they are trying to do. The discussion in class needs to be managed. You need to try to call on everyone at least once during the week. I generally keep a list to make sure that there is no one I have overlooked. Next, you need to understand that the day requires an arc, a story that helps the students feel that they have learned something and that they are organized. This story begins with simpler problems and build it to a key problem or two that should end, if all goes well, 10 or so minutes before the end of the class time. It's fairly important that the class ends on a success, although once or twice during the semester you can leave them hanging with a problem that is not solved. The last little bit of time at the end of the class is a good opportunity to summarize the day. I generally do a summary podcast shortly after the class to give them a sense of what they've accomplished for the day. To get material for that podcast, I generally ask two questions. What's the biggest lesson of the day? And I usually try to get three or four people to answer it until we get a consensus. The next question I ask is, what's the one thing you still don't understand? What's the big outstanding issue? Sometimes you'll have to ask several people before you get one of them to respond. Nonetheless, as a teacher in the inverted classroom, it's important for you to understand the subjects that your students think that they don't understand. There are few things in academic life that teach us the techniques of the inverted classroom. Most everything that we do, presentations, decisions, discussions of the university, tend to reinforce the conventional idea of a single lecture, a class, exams, grades. In fact, the inverted classroom is much closer to coaching. You play the role of coach or director. Your students are the team and the opponent is the material, the material that the students must master and for which they must demonstrate their mastery. As you work with them, the key goals are to build trust, trust in you, trust in themselves, and trust in each other. And that involves making mistakes, making mistakes publicly in front of you, in front of their peers, and in front of themselves. Your goal is to guide them through that process, help them overcome that self-consciousness, and from time to time teach them a technique or an idea that will help them get beyond the problem that they are currently facing. This has been some of the most satisfying teaching that I have ever done, because you're building a relationship of trust with a student, and it means that as they advance in their academic lives and in their careers, they come back with that relation of trust, a trust that says, this is what you've shown me and this is what I've done with it. A trust that will also then ask, what should my next step of my career, my work, my life be? The inverted classroom has been a powerful tool in my career and I hope it will be in yours. This is David Allen Greer. Take care.